Hello, I'm Victoria Takeda with the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival Committee, here to welcome you to today's CATS panel presentation on motherhood and parenthood. Tonight, we spotlight foreign filmmakers screening their films at our festival, which begins Friday, October the 28th. In these three films, we find our protagonists struggling with their own individual life-changing decisions to be or not to be a parent, a life-changing decision impacted by intergenerational cultural beliefs and norms. Each will experience the unforeseen emotional and psychological ups and downs from tears, angst, and joy in pursuit of their decision. Join us for a panel discussion as filmmaker Albert Chan, Rebecca Chu, Felicity Lou Hill, and Dorothy Zhao share their insights on filmmaking and the complex issues of motherhood and parenthood. I would like now to introduce Leanne Lam from Contemporary Asian Theater Scene, who will lead tonight's discussion and introduce our distinguished guest. Leanne. Thank you so much, Vicki, and welcome everybody to this first program related to our filmmakers, our esteemed filmmakers who tell stories unlike anyone else can. I'd like to introduce first our first filmmaker, who is Albert Chan. Welcome, Albert. Hi, Leanne. Very, very nice to have you from New York. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. I'd like to also introduce Rebecca Chu. Hi. Thank you for joining, Rebecca. And we have Dorothy Zhao, also from Southern California. Come on in, Dorothy. Hi, everyone. I'm a director and writer of Tarot and As Bitter as Sweet. Nice to see you, and thanks for having us. Excellent. And our last filmmaker, I'd like to introduce Felicity LaHill. Hi, thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks so much. I'm glad everyone could join us. I know everyone was just, this is coming off the our work schedule. So I'm glad we everyone made time to come in. This is wonderful. Um, I'd like to do around um, the horn and, and if you can introduce yourself, the film that you're created and um, also what your role was in the film. So um, let's start with Albert. Hi, I'm Albert M. Chan. I'm the writer, director and actor in The Commitment. The Commitment um, was a semi-biographical story based on my own life. Um, it's about an interracial gay couple who goes to adopt a newborn baby. Um, they have a birth mother who's interested in having um, them parent her child. And at the very last moment, she changes her mind. And so the movie deals with what happens after that fact and does this couple stay together. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's go with Rebecca and Felicity. Hi, thanks again for having us today. Um, so I'm Rebecca, I'm the writer and producer of Sitting the Month. Um, I'll let Felicity also introduce herself in a bit. Um, just to give a brief about our film, um, this was a film loosely based on my personal experience, um, but it's essentially following a Chinese American woman who's a new mother and she struggles to honor the postpartum Chinese traditions of her late mother. Um, so we follow her experience as she um, meets a confinement nanny who comes in to help her during the first month. And we watch as she pivots between the cultural experiences that um, are that she's torn between from a both Eastern perspective and Western values as a Chinese American. Um, Excellent. Felicity, go ahead, we'd like to introduce and add to that. Yeah, and I'm Felicity Lujo and I'm the director and co-producer for Sitting the Month. Thanks, Rebecca. Excellent. And Dorothy. Hi, I'm Dorothy. Uh, I directed and wrote Tarot and As Bitter as Sweet. Tarot is essentially a film about a young woman who discovers that she's pregnant and ends up summoning her future self to help her make the decision and hears an answer that she doesn't quite expect. And as Bitter as Sweet is a short film about two single moms who are struggling with their own uh, uh, pressures and struggles of motherhood and their precon and not attaining their preconceived ideals of what they think they should be as perfect moms. And it explores what happens when one of the moms bonds better with the other uh, 
mom's baby. Excellent. Thank you, Dorothy. Let's talk about um, the evolution of these films and how the project actually came about. Um, Rebecca, can you start and talk talk about some of the issues that were um, covered in your film? Yeah, um, our film has some key themes, but I think at the forefront, it's um, it's two things. Really, there's um, the cross-cultural tension between East and West values um, as they relate to motherhood. And second, it's really about healing as well. Um, our main character has some um, issues with the uh, death of her mother that she hasn't internally resolved yet. And going becoming a mother for the first time is something that she uh, has to deal with um, those issues. So um, as far as how it came about, uh, as I mentioned, there was some loose personal <laughs> experience with this. Um, just a bit more about my background. I'm, I'm Chinese American, um, born and raised in the US, but I've spent a lot of my adult life in Singapore where I was working and living for a time and all three of my kids were born there. Um, when I had my first child, uh, I did what you would expect a strong independent woman um, who grew up in the West might do, which is try to do everything on my own. Um, tried to, you know, fight through the nights by myself, insisted that um, I didn't need the help. Uh, when it was time for me to return from my maternity leave back to work, um, my predominantly Chinese uh, colleagues saw how tired I was. Uh, I was complaining about these joint aches that I had that just wouldn't go away. And everyone was like, um, you didn't sit the month? Like, you had, you had to have sit the month, sat the month. I mean, it's like, it's just a, a critical part of like, being a mom, you need to do that first month of postpartum traditions that all of our mothers did and generations before that. Um, but, uh, you know, naturally I was intrigued by this. It was not something that I really uh, had thought about too much because, you know, as an American, I kind of brushed it off as something that was very outdated traditions of, you know, our former ancestors. And uh, ultimately I decided that it was something I should probably give a try as someone living in Singapore. It was an option available to me that's not, it's not as widely available to say a mother in the US, uh, but I decided to give it a shot. And I, 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 I will say that having done it for both my second and third child, um, having gone through the practice and hiring a confinement nanny for both of those children, um, it became very apparent to me how different were the approaches to that postpartum period and the attitude towards mothers in general, especially new mothers, uh, from a Chinese perspective, and how that was comparing to many of the experiences that a lot of my friends back in the U.S. were experiencing. Um, so just to like kind of expand on that, I mean, I had I was seeing Facebook posts where people were kind of being um, promoted, I guess, or like um, encouraged for like bouncing back as soon as possible. I had a friend whose husband was like very proud of his wife for getting back into yoga two days after giving birth. And it was just such a different attitude because uh, I would say in Singapore and in the Chinese culture, it was very much um, rest, recuperate. And, you know, you see this in our film too, because uh, our protagonist, she's trying to be independent, um, but she's trying to honor what her mother would have wanted um, in following these traditions. And she has this nanny who comes in and is just trying to like get her to do nothing. And that's such a weird concept um, to think about uh, from, I guess, the American perspective, which is like mothers go out and do everything. <laughs> you gotta be out there, you know, you can, you can go back to work, you can do all the housework, you can nurse your baby at night. Um, I will say Felicity has a lot to share about this because she recently became a mother. Um, and I'm sure she would love to talk about this as well. So, you know, I'll, I'm happy to pass it over to Felicity if you'd like um, to just share some of your experience filming and uh, as a seven month pregnant woman, so. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, seven months pregnant during the um, production of our film. And um, I gave birth between production and post-production. Rebecca was gracious enough to um, allow a little bit of a break before our post-production. Um, and I actually can attest that it is very difficult to sit the month in Western society because I tried to do it and I had a very difficult time. Um, I ended up actually ordering a confinement meal service um, and I tried to follow the practices on my own. It turned out to be very challenging um, when nobody is there to kind of help you and guide you <laughs> um, and you're getting all these pressures to like 
um, you know, like I was hosting my in-laws at the time and, you know, like, oh, people want to like go out and do things, um, you know, uh, visiting the baby and everything while the sit the month practice is very much like you should just stay in bed and rest and um, take care of yourself. Um, and then, of course, just the, the American standard of of breastfeeding and um, just you know, you are the sole caretaker of your child and being like your your baby's entire world um, was I definitely felt a lot of that as well. So um, I am echoing everything that Rebecca is saying <laughs> in terms of the development and background for our film. Excellent. Well, thank you too for for uh, bringing such experience um, and hands on experience to the role <laughs> while you're at it. Um, Albert, can you talk about the, where your project um, came from. I think you talked a little bit about about how this is a personal story as well. Sure. Um, back in around, I would say, 2010, uh, me and my husband decided to uh, try adopting a newborn baby. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's just not depicted very well in movies because you have uh, prospective adoptive parents have to go through this whole rigmarole. You know, there's like FBI fingerprints, they have to run it in the database, you have to do police checks, you have to take courses, um, and you're just have to be vetted. And once you're vetted, which takes a while, um, then you're just waiting, you're just sitting there waiting for, you know, a birth mother to choose you. Um, and so it's a roller coaster ride. And people told me this beforehand, and I didn't really realize I didn't really understand what they meant. Until we were matched, we had a match, a birth mother was interested in us. Um, and on the, I think it was the day before we were supposed to meet her, she was pregnant at the time, um, the day before we were supposed to meet her, I think we were told that she had changed her mind. Um, and so we were really disappointed because we had been getting ready for the, the arrival. Um, and so I decided to channel the feelings of disappointment and I wrote this screenplay, which is loosely based on my own experiences. And, um, that's how the commitment came about. Thank you so much. And Dorothy, you have a couple of films that um, you have, uh, yeah. you brought in a lot of key issues. Can you talk about how your projects came about? Yes, so Tarot came about because I myself have a lot of friends who are new mothers who um, are struggling with motherhood. And also I, I, I I'm scared of that concept and I, my, my, my parents are constantly pressuring me and I think the idea of motherhood was just not so exciting to me and so I thought something was wrong with me so I started googling whether something was wrong with me the idea that I didn't want to be a mom or I'm not ready to be one or I'm scared and I've stumbled across all of these reddit threads posted by women who talked about how they felt so much shame for wanting to live child-free lives or even mothers who actually, you know, regretted being moms or, or just didn't really like their current situations. And they just felt uh, so guilty for feeling that way that, you know, they couldn't even talk about it openly. They created these throwaway accounts because they didn't want their names to be revealed. And so I wanted to make a film that basically it tells people like hey you're not alone in feeling this and it's totally okay like whether or not you are a mom if you like lots of people feel ashamed for their feelings and it's okay to have negative feelings and I think the dark side of motherhood is something that's not really talked about in media um, because in society people kind of put this whole idea of like oh you know motherhood is like one of the things being a mom is one of the things you should do when you hit a certain age and you know they talk about pregnant I mean the glow and like you're it's like one of the best things you could do in your life and you know I mean it might not be the case for a lot of folks um and I just wanted to kind of like acknowledge that and for as bitter as sweet that film came about because you know came, both of the films came about in very similar during similar times during a time when I was trying to process these feelings and so I really needed to write about different scenarios and for as bitter as sweet, uh, that was inspired by my aunt who actually uh, came out from China to the United States, left her children behind in China to come out here to make money to send send money back home, and she became a live-in nanny for some 
for somebody else's children and I and she basically never went back to see her own kids or rarely I think she went back once in like 10-15 years and I wanted to explore like how difficult that could have been for her and the story as bittersweet is very loosely based on my aunt um so it's you know there is very it's a very dark story uh I would say that you would probably need to be in the right mindset to watch it because it's really sad. <laughs> and that didn't happen to, fortunately, whatever happens in the story is not real. You know, my my family is fine, but I I was just experiencing a very dark, play, uh, dark feelings myself. And so I wanted to put it on the page and in on the screen. Thank you, Dorothy. I, I think it was, it is a, a real, poignant film and uh, and very important and I think there's a lot of feelings of shame and judgment that go along with that um, and I was wondering about why it was really important to give light to the to that issue the issues that you covered I struggle with a lot of shame myself uh, in terms of just how differently I feel from what's traditional like I'm also Chinese American like Rebecca and I'm constantly caught between two worlds and actually multiple worlds just because I feel like I'm always thinking differently from my friends my family even my own sibling like my my sister would love to be a mom and I am it's just not exciting to me and you know my parents are constantly wondering why I think a certain way and so because I feel so much shame I I want to basically under uh, I feel so much shame about these situations and I think I, I I realize that I'm not the only one that feels this way so I think it's that's kind of what drives me to tell these stories because I I don't want other people to feel as alone as I do in this I think a lot of people feel alone in their loneliness and those negative feelings that they have and I wanted to basically bring them to light because I want to at least show the ones who feel the same way as me that hey you're not alone and it's totally okay to feel how you feel Excellent. Thank you so much. There's nothing like um, having feeling isolated and you know that you're not, but you're not getting any feedback otherwise. Um, Felicity, can you um, comment on that one about the, uh, the elements of judgment that may be coming with that film? Um, yeah, so I totally understand what you're saying, Dorothy. Um, I I've noticed that um, I think both in uh, American society and Chinese society, I think that parenthood is is regarded as something that's very sacred and and something that you can't really like talk negatively about at all to the point where um, I've noticed from my own experience, like if I complain about something or if I say something, you know, something about being a mom is like not all like rainbows and butterflies um, like even my husband will be like, okay, but you know, don't, don't talk about it. Like, don't say anything <laughs> like that's, that's going to bring bad luck. That's going to bring, you know, um, bad juju to the situation. Um, so I can definitely understand how there would be a lot of shame in terms of thinking negatively about, or, you know, vocalizing anything negative about parenthood. And even beyond that, um, I think there are so many like aspects of parenthood that, can bring a lot of shame and um, our film uh, touches on this too, um, like asking for help or um, I, I've personally experienced this a lot with like breastfeeding and the amount of like pressure there is to breastfeed. Um, and just feeling like, you know, if you can't do it all, there's, there's gotta be something wrong with you. And that is, is the root of, of shame. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely understand. <laughs> um, Rebecca, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's just so much about what's expected um, and how we manage those expectations. Um, I mean, I think Felicity definitely nailed it for what it meant in our film. Um, but one of the big things too about our film was um, this concept of healing uh, because our character has to um, deal with the death of her mother as she's becoming a mother. And there's a lot of that she's recalling. Um, there's a couple flashbacks where we see that 
there's this dynamic of the mother daughter relationship that, you know, is very central in many Asian <laughs> or Chinese um, American films, this uh, central relationship that uh, tends to be more complex than you might think in from a Western perspective. Um, so for me, a lot of that um, concept of shame and judgment, it's like, I mean, I grew up looking at different Western families and seeing that dynamic and then thinking, how does that compare with the dynamic that I might have with my parents? And it's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of cultural differences. We could certainly talk a lot um, about that. But for me, it's like the expectation of what that relationship should look like um, and how it how you may feel with the multi-generational as aspect with your own mother and how that gets passed on to how that may be different or the same with how you pass it on to the next generation after after that. And I do think you see some facets of that of Iris, our main character, and what she's passing on of the traditions from her mother's culture to her you know, baby that will eventually grow up and pass that down further to other generations. Thank you, Rebecca. And and Albert, it's um, related to the elements of being perfect <laughs> and um, shame or negative judgment. How would you say that was um, important in your film? Well, I think it was important in a in a on a different plane. Um, I think when I created this film, it was actually around ten years ago, and back then there were, I mean, you didn't really hear much about gay parenthood. Um, it's not. It's more accepted now, especially since I live in New York City. Um, but it certainly wasn't that common back then. And so I guess the fact that I was even depicting aspects of my own life on the screen, that there could be a loving gay couple who's been married, that they loved each other so much that they wanted to have a child, you know, those were things that I think I think are helpful to the LGBT community to be able to see themselves, especially a person of color. Um, be in a leading role, being in a happy marriage, um, and, you know, wanting to have children. Uh, and, you know, even for people who are outside of the LGBT community, I mean, they, it's, it, it becomes quite clear that, you know, gay people are just the same as any other parents. They can be the same as any other parents, and they can um, be a wonderful home to any child. Thank you. Yeah, Dorothy, you mentioned something about a woman leaving her own child behind in order to come over to the United States to take care of other children. And I think that's definitely a, a cross-cultural kind of issue. Um, can you talk about that for a bit? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's definitely something you see in a lot of immigrant communities. I grew up in Alhambra, which is basically made up of a lot of immigrant Asian and Latino communities. And so there were a lot of folks I saw that were essentially, you know, taking care of other people's kids who left their own kids behind to do so. And like I said, my aunt was one of them. And it it was something that was really normal to me as a kid, because that's just how I thought things were. But it didn't, it wasn't until my adulthood when I started thinking about, you know, motherhood that I was like, crap, like my aunt left her own kids behind to come out here. And she like barely went back. Um, and then she um would be at this house living and for five days a week she would get the weekends off and then she would stay at my grandma's during the times off but eventually my my um one of my cousins did come out too to the states but there was another one of my cousins her oldest son just ended up staying in China so she like never saw him and I just thought that it must have been so painful for her to to have to experience that and um now she's just so used to being here uh but i i yeah i just it's just something i really um i don't want to say that it's um it was something that was normal to her but i feel like it shouldn't be something that's normal it's just it was really a sad situation and it sucks that a lot of people have to do that like the family separation is tough and it does change relationships between parents and their children and I, I I think if she had another if she had a different chance she would have done it differently but she did it because she had to and I'm just so fortunate to have grown up the way I did you know having had my parents here with me here in the states so thank you I also like to introduce our uh, my co-moderator Caroline Moore Caroline Hi. 
Thank you, Leanne. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline, and I'm on the CATS board. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to ask how your personal experiences with motherhood influenced the issues that you wanted to highlight in your film. Um, Rebecca, would you like to take a shot at that first? Yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to this concept of healing, I guess, um, because we talk a lot about healing in general in the modern world, um, and what does that really mean? But um, I think as it relates to motherhood, um, healing is something I think we have to do on both like a physical level after giving birth, as well as um, an emotional level. Um, and from a personal, from my own personal experience, um, I will say that, you know, my first birth, um, it was um, not, not easy. <laughs> and they actually, actually, I'd say um, subsequently got harder the older I got with um, each, preg each, each subsequent pregnancy. So um, I tried to build that into the film uh, as I was writing it too, because um, you know you you have to really realize. And I don't think you often see this in mainstream media at all, but that period post birth, we're expected to do so much, um, right as like, our bodies are being ripped apart in various ways, um, and so there's that expectation that we need to really. Um, uh, heal ourselves before we can actually help another. And I just think something that um, was very personal for me was just this idea. And it became very clear once I had the confinement nanny that I didn't have for my first birth. Once I was able to have the experience of someone who's showing me, like, I'm going to take care of the mother so that the mother can then take care of the child. Um, that was something that was really eye-opening for me because um, I like to say, you know, you can't you can't pour from an empty cup, right? And so you can't drain the mother of everything um, and then expect her to then raise the child, take care of the child, make sure the baby survives, right? There's just so much that goes into it. Um, so I wanted that to be a very clear message from the film. And I hope that that does get taken away because I think our character does, you know, without spoiling it, <laughs> our character does um, go undergo a change in thinking um, by the end of the film. Yeah, that's so insightful. It's it's almost like going back to the message on an airplane. You know, put your oxygen mask on first, and then assist your child. Yeah, it's <laughs> true, and that and it, it doesn't stop <laughs> in that first month. It goes on for the rest of for the rest of your oh. life, your lives, right? I mean, you have to be, you have to take care of yourself. Self-care is very important before you can care for another. Definitely. And I think that's a message that, you know, so many mothers need to hear because oftentimes we ignore ourselves so that we can care for our children. So great message. Um, Albert, do you want to chime in on that? <clears throat> sure. Um, so, like I said, the, the commitment was based on my experience with our first match falling through. What I didn't address in the movie was that in real life, um, we actually had five matches. So the first four actually fell through. So this is the roller coaster that people had told me about that you're waiting for like possibly what could be a year or two mm -hmm. for a match. It comes through and then all of a sudden it doesn't. Or all of a sudden you get a match and you have to like drop everything and like drive across the country to like pick up and meet the child. Um, so our fifth match was our son, Andrew, and he's now 11. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually shot the film two weeks before he was born. So I was praying that the birth mother didn't give birth early. <laughs> and, and fortunately she didn't, she, she was, a, he was a term baby. Um, but I guess what I wanted to, part of why I made the film was I wanted it to be also a love letter to my son, just mm -hmm. to show him, because it's about a, a gay couple and what happens in the aftermath of this match falling through. And in the end, what they realize is that the mm -hmm. love that they had for each other that inspired them to have a child is the love that will pull them through. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the message at the end of the movie. And um, that's what I wanted to also convey to my son, um, that he was born out of love. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I think we're going to touch on it later, but parenthood and having a child has such an impact on the 
the parents' relationship, um, positively and negatively. So it, it really impacts that, uh, that relationship. So that's, that's a great issue to explore. Uh, Felicity, would you like to answer this? um about the couple or about the uh the about how your personal experience influenced what you want to highlight oh, in yes. your film. um <laughs> yeah so it was really interesting because my relationship with the film evolved a lot <laughs> from the, from development to the end of post-production so um when i first um basically begged Rebecca to let me uh collaborate with her <laughs> um I <Collaborating>, totally <laughs> I was um I knew I knew about the tradition of sitting the month but it was a very it was it was a concept that felt very distant from me it was one of those things I was like this is incredibly interesting and I want people to know about it and I want it to be on the forefront um of you know media because it's not really talked about um and you know this this culture clash of asian versus western values is something that i am very much interested in i'm biracial i'm half white i'm half chinese um so that's a that's a common theme that i'm really interested in um and uh and also mothers and daughters i think rebecca and i both have a have a great um interest in that but i was thinking about it more in terms of me and my mother not me and my child um when we had first started and then of course i got pregnant <laughs> um during the development process um while we were in pre-production you know uh just growing <laughs> um life inside me and then um through the production process and um i was thinking more and more in terms of what it would look like when i'm in this phase when i'm you know there with iris going through that process of taking care of a baby while also trying to take care of myself um and basically i i went through a lot of the stuff that iris um ha goes through and it feels very very real and very genuine and the themes that rebecca hits upon on the script um this concept of healing like what rebecca was talking about just reminded me that um in terms of american versus chinese culture something that a lot of people don't talk about when after you give birth in a hospital in the u.s um, and I'm pretty sure this is probably not the way in China, although I haven't given birth in China. Um, they basically don't let you rest. It's like for the first 24 hours. And I, I left after 24 hours. I was very much like, I need to get out of here. Um, but they don't let you sleep. So throughout the night, I gave birth at 9 p.m. And every couple of hours, they are knocking at your door and trying to get you to do things. They don't let you sleep. They're checking your, your temperature. They're checking um you know they're checking on the iv bag they're checking on all these things and i'm like just just let oh and they're also making sure that you're breastfeeding and like doing all this stuff and they don't let you sleep and i'm like i've been in labor for 16 plus hours can i can i rest now please so i feel like it's it's interesting that even not even a month long rest just a day rest <laughs> is like a foreign concept in in uh in western culture um and this this notion of healing is so incredibly important and this this notion of taking care of yourself in order to take care of the baby is something that is only just gotten more important and more pronounced the longer that i've been a mother um and yeah i i really i feel like that this is this is a story that i'm going to be uh keeping for a very very long time <laughs> such such an interesting contrast between east and west it's fascinating i had no idea um that that was the tradition in the east and it makes so much sense so i think we do in the west just rush it so much there's so much pressure on the mother to return in full to work or activities and it's just uh so much pressure makes and, it and very and difficult also, also the insurance insurance makes us go Yes, out as well, which is so sad. We don't have the um, opportunity to relax. They'll get you out as soon as they clear. They can. Absolutely, I know. When I gave birth, um, they were calling it drive-by deliveries because they would only let us stay in the hospital for twenty-four hours max. So yes, and you're absolutely right. You can't get any rest in the hospital. So 
<laughs> you go from that to going home and being a full-time everything at home. Great, great answers and insight. Um, Dorothy, did you want to add anything about your own personal experiences and how that influenced what you wanted to highlight in your films? Sure. Um, I am not a parent, but I want to say that parents are my heroes. So all of you here who are parents, <laughs> you're all amazing for, for just doing what you're doing. And, you know, it, it's a huge sacrifice. I'm very aware of that. And I feel like making these films has been my way of really processing that fear that I have and being able to talk about it with, with all of you and also talking about it as I've been taking these films through the festival run. I have been less scared about it um, and I'm willing to let fate decide when it finally happens for me, if it happens. Um, but yeah, I, right. I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for allowing me to share this space with you. I know this is a panel about parenthood, <laughs> but I really do. I am so grateful to be hearing these things, you know, hearing you all talk about issues that are just not easy to share publicly. So thank you for, for doing that. Well, I think your topic is so interesting too, because it's such a major decision that impacts the rest of your life. And, um, you know, it is scary. And a lot of people don't acknowledge that. So that was a great topic to explore. Great. Well, I'm going to hand it back to Leanne for the next question. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great conversation. And, uh, you know, you're, each of you are your for your filmmaker <laughs> you are um pursuing the arts and not which is not necessarily something that um, our parents might have wished upon us they always say you can um they they love a, a student they love their children to go and learn an instrument as a student but when it comes to career that changes and I'm wondering what challenges you might have experienced in pursuing the arts um, as a filmmaker and what you might have had to go through that um, in addressing parental pressures or outside pressures. Um, that's sort of a whopping one right now. Um, Albert, let's start with you. So, so my parents don't actually have an issue with me being in the arts because I actually got my PhD in, from MIT and I, I have a full-time job as an engineer, so I'm financially stable. So that's the good thing. But I guess more seriously, I think looking back on my early years, um, you know, when I was a kid in, in high school, I was extremely focused on math and science. Um, and so I didn't have any time to explore the arts. And the same was true in, in, in undergrad too, when I, when I was uh, uh, at University of Toronto. And uh, and it was only until I went to MIT where I had to do a PhD for seven years, a solo project. And, you know, around like year five or so, I started to do some serious soul searching. And that's when I decided I was going to like expand my horizons. And I tried to do everything I could on campus. And MIT is great because everyone's so focused on their studies that they don't even take advantage of all of the free things that are on campus. Like I took tennis lessons, sailing lessons, basketball lessons. There was had a dark room and I was in the dark room for like 10 hours sometimes. Um, one time I was locked in the dark room because it was the day before Thanksgiving and I didn't realize it was closing early and I was literally chained in to, in the student center. And so I had to call the campus police to let me out. But that was sort of my awakening, my artistic awakening. And so um, I, I, from that point on, I just sort of went on continue on both paths and and you can you can do it you know if you are, have a flexible enough job um and and people who who understand you wow that is quite an experience um that um <laughs> that i think you'll um appreciate all the way through i i think you you got the gold star by going to mit i, I do have to admit but um that's always a, a good help <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go to um the dorothy dorothy how about you in, in your in your um pursuit i know you've been in the arts for quite a long time 
And I was supposed to be a doctor as a kid. You know, uh, my parents had big dreams because doctors make a lot of money, you know, and um, I think they accepted when I wanted to pivot into filmmaking because I was working at different, very stable jobs working in like at UCLA in and all these other gigs and they they saw how miserable I was when I came home I'd be crying I would come home crying because I was so unhappy with my my job and I wanted so much to pursue the arts but I was too scared to because I didn't want to bring shame to them you know and shame has definitely like driven a lot of my you know younger years and so when I finally decided to just try making films and, and they saw how happy I was they accepted it I think every now and then they'll be like when are you done with this hobby of yours you know um but I I've just learned to ignore that statement and they'll never say that they're proud of me because that's just an Asian parent thing but what the way that I know is that if I send them a film, they'll watch it multiple times. They'll play it multiple times and I can hear it playing. So I'm like, okay, they're watching it more than once. Or my dad will be like, have you heard about that film by Chloe Zhao that just came out, blah, blah, blah. You know, some random film unrelated to me, but he'll be like, you know, she did this, blah, blah, blah. And so that's how I know like, okay, they are, you know, keeping their thumb on the news, just understanding what's going on in the film scene. Um, and so that's how I know that they support me. You know, I don't think they'll ever say it outright until I bring in a lot of money <laughs> that, that they're proud of me. But just this is their way of showing their love. And I'm I'm OK with that for now. <laughs> it, it's a transformation for for everybody. And it's great that your parents are are evolving in in their mindset. I think that's a, a wonderful thing and very um, it, we, we're proud of you. <laughs> And um, I, <laughs> I and what I think what and what you're doing for for everyone in the in this room, um, for for their film, it takes courage to do something that is um, not the perfect film of the perfect story. It's it's really honest storytelling, and that is extremely effective. So thank you. Takes a lot of courage to do that. Uh, Rebecca, can we talk about your experience as far as pursuing the arts as an Asian American? Yeah, definitely. Uh, where do I begin? Gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I fully had a previous career before pivoting into the arts and um, focusing on really what, what I like to say is um, being there for the next generation. Um, I say this because I think when I was growing up, I definitely had an interest in filmmaking, um, but it was not certainly not encouraged um, in my household uh, and certainly did not have role models to look up to. And I think what happens, and I, I see this in my own children, but they their children are going to model what they see in the household and what they see in their parents. And um, my parents, immigrants um, from Taiwan who uh, really had to work hard in corporate jobs, um, and that was their way of achieving security and stability. So I think for many years, I modeled that, um, thinking that that was what the option was, and that was what I was kind of meant to do as well. Um, I would say definitely was not encouraged to go into the arts by any means, um, and I, I, I put myself on a path that I thought was what I was supposed to do. Um, that did involve going to going to Stanford. Um, I, I got my economics degree from Stanford. I went back and got my MBA from Stanford. And I went and I worked in tech uh, entertainment on the corporate side for quite some time. Uh, I would say what really changed things for me personally was uh, having kids. Um, what it meant for me was that I, I had two young girls at the time when I made the decision to leave my Corporate, very stable, very lucrative corporate job. Um, the decision was really because I, I looked at my girls <laughs> and I realized that I wanted to do something that was really bigger than myself. Um, and I wanted to do something that was going to help them and the next generation. And that really meant for me going back to the basics of looking when I was a kid, what were the things that I loved to do that I didn't really pursue? And it came back to filmmaking. That's how I ended up pivoting into it. Um, it's definitely a journey. It's an ongoing journey, but um, I know that when I wake up every day, I'm pursuing something that is bigger than me now. Um, I'm I'm really trying to get out there and tell stories from unrepresented communities, um, underrepresented communities, and this is really my opportun opportunity to do that. 
Um, I, I know that my parents, um, similar to Dorothy, they, they never really say that they're proud, but I, I do think, um, I do think that they've come around to, um, come around to this concept of me being a filmmaker. I, I also get random WhatsApps from my mom being like, here's the, here's the industry news. Like, oh, have you thought about talking to so-and-so? Like, you know, your grandfather's sons, you know, like who's in the industry doing X, Y, Z. Like, so they're trying to like hook me up with some, with some people that they know peripherally. So that's, that's really helpful. But then some other times my mom will send me like another job description for Amazon. And <laughs> she's like, Hey, like, are you thinking about getting a job at Amazon? Like, and I'm like, okay, mixed, mixed signals. But I think ultimately, yeah, coming around to it and, um, you know, similar to Albert too. I mean, I had, a, I fully had a career before this, um, that I, that I, uh, stopped for a time to to pursue this, um, and so uh, ultimately that that career I think has put me in a very good position to be what I'm doing doing what I'm doing now. Um, I think, of course, it would help to have started this journey much earlier, but um, I do think also that uh, it, it helps to have built some skills that will be relevant no matter what, and to be able to use those skills, whether it's producing a film or working with a collaborative team in a you know tricky environment, that kind of thing. So nothing is for nothing is wasted and nothing is um yeah nothing is lost well i mean i came to it later in life too and it's not just the skills that you've acquired it's the life experience oh, and, yeah. and, and having things to actually say that are meaningful oh yeah absolutely i mean i i do think that yeah there's the there's the wisdom that one um gathers along the way of just being in the human condition right and which is what filmmaking is all about is sharing our human condition and the triumphs and challenges of that so yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I, think I actually have a quick anecdote about my mother, if I can. Oh, absolutely. I think she may be watching right now, but um, I recently got um, a screenwriting fellowship um, that's in LA. So I flew out and I received the award and she was telling everyone. So then I hear from my aunt and she's like, oh, your mom says that you're going to Hollywood now with some big production. I was like, it's significant, but I don't think it's that significant. <laughs> anyway. Well, congratulations. I think that's that's a vote of I think all of you have won awards. And so it's it's if, if that helps um the pride element, then so be it, because you know what you're doing is important. Um Felicity, let's hear your story about your uh pursuit. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is making me think that there should be like a support group for Asian parents with kids in the arts. Um, <laughs> I think they need it. Um, yeah, but for me, I, I realized really early on that I wanted to um, do something that uh, my mom would not approve of. I really fell in love with writing, acting, theater. I was all about that from a very early age, um, which basically started a decade long argument with my mom, a lot of screaming matches going on. Um, and basically she insisted that I had to get a degree in a hard science and I landed in computer science. So I have a degree in computer science, which I have not used. <laughs> um, that's not true. I've used it mildly. Um, uh, but along the way, I did a double major in English literature. And as you can imagine, there is no cross section between those majors. So I was taking 20 credits um, every semester trying to get that done um, to graduate in time. Um, but even still, uh, my mom was just chugging away, trying so hard to get me to do something else, trying to get me to go to grad school for computer science because she didn't get the message. Um, and then eventually uh, she gave up and just sent me an LSAT book when I decided to uh, apply for film school. Um, because we, as, as we all know, that's the, that's the, um, you know, the, the, what you fall back on is to become a lawyer in, um, the Asian realm of professions. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, so it was a lot of me just kind of being like, this is what I got to do. And, um, I realized that, um, looking back now, the underlying theme of what my interests were because i was i i was acting and i was you know i was writing and i was doing all these things and i realized now that what i was most interested in was storytelling um which leanne you you touched on this and that was really the heart of what i was most interested in, and still am most interested in 
Um, I mean, obviously directing is something that I, I love to do, but in addition, um, writing scripts, writing uh, prose, I've written a novel. <laughs> um, so all of these things have to do with storytelling. Um, and um, yeah, in terms of like when I realized that um, my mom was proud of me, Albert, you like stepped on my toes a little bit because the moment that I realized was when she got super, super excited when I told her that I got into USC. She got more excited when I told her that I got into USC for grad school than when I told her I was pregnant. Um, and, uh, and she ended up bragging to everybody. That's the Chinese equivalent of of tell, saying that you're proud is when you start bragging to to your friends, um, and that's when I knew I was like, okay, um, <laughs> maybe I'm doing something that that she approves of and uh, can be proud of. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely been a, a fight to get here, but a fight that's that's been worthwhile and. I really, I really do cherish all the experience that I've had. Um, and I did meet my husband through the computer science uh, degree that I got. So I definitely have her to thank for that. <laughs> well, this is, this. these are, I mean, entertaining, but these are really harsh realities. I feel like this group here is the most overachieving group ever. Um, if you can manage this, you can do anything. I mean, making a film will be easy, right? Because you've done it all and under very um, tough circumstances. So congratulations on that. Did you? you know, have I'm a firm believer in that, you know, whatever road you've taken to get to be a filmmaker, everything that you've done is not wasted because everything you've done contributes to your point of view, uh, the stories you want to tell. And and colors just everything about your filmmaking. So I'm a firm believer that nothing is ever wasted. Excellent. Let's move on, Caroline. I think you have. We have this. This hour has flown by, but we have one final it question has. we don't want to ask. It has, and um, this is quite an intriguing question. Um, do you feel that the act of creating art as an Asian American is an act of activism? And if so, when did you realize that you had this platform for activism? Uh, Rebecca, would you like to answer sure. that first? Yeah, um, so, I mean, again, for me, it's really about the next generation. Um, a lot of this activism for me has been showing my children and really my children represent the next generation, um, showing them that this is what's possible for our community. Um, it's not what I grew up with, which was, you know, there's only a few select paths that are respectable, but this is like what's possible. You can be an artist, you know, you don't, you don't, um, you can share your art with the world. Uh, and particularly because we don't see a lot of the narratives around our community, this is something that I really wanted to bring to light for them and their friends and down the line. Um, beyond them. I mean, think about what we grew up with. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't much um, by way of Asian American stories. I mean, there was a select few and we should definitely thank, you know, our, the people who helped do those films. But I think now we're at a time when it really is about the opportunities to tell different kinds of narratives that are um, more authentic. They don't necessarily have to all be around identity and like, you know, understanding the two different tensions, but really just authentic stories that feature people like us um, and that who can, yeah, that we can then um, have our children know that there's a lot more dynamic um, stories to be told about people who are like them. Um, so yeah, for me, it's it's for the next generation. That's what activism is and showing um, showing what's possible. Definitely. And, and definitely getting that representation out there, I think, is so important for the next generation to see. What about you, Albert? How do you feel about that? <clears throat> well, I started off as an actor. Um, I, mm -hmm. when I was at MIT, I just decided on the whim to just audition for Gilbert and Sullivan Operetta. And after that, I got the role and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. um, but after a few years, you know, after understanding like how the Hollywood industry sees Asian Americans, I was encouraged. People told me you should make your own material. Don't sit around waiting for someone to give you your dream role. Write your dream role and then produce it yourself. And that's how I got into filmmaking. And so, absolutely, like creating films, especially as an underrepresented uh, minority in media, 
um, isn't a form of activism, uh, especially since you know not not just am I Asian American, I'm also uh, I'm also um, in the LGBT community. I'm depicting um, Asian Asian American, gay Asian Americans, which you know if you think Asian American is underrepresented, gay Asian American is even more underrepresented. Um, and just showing that you know we're we're just normal people. We're normal people that have to deal with um, issues that are universal to all human beings. And that's sort of what I've tried to convey just by telling you know aspects of my own life within the films that I make. Yes, fantastic. It's so great to share your stories and and break down some of those preconceptions and barriers. Just really, really important, great work. What about you, Dorothy? For me, for the longest time, the idea of activism, actually, I always thought activists were people who were on the ground organizing, you know, doing really political rallies and things like that. And it wasn't until I started working with Visual Communications, which is a nonprofit that um, it's based in LA that focuses on lift, uplifting Asian American and Pacific Islander voices um, that I realized that art can be used as activism. And I specialize mostly in fictional narrative work. And I never thought that, you know, fictional stories could mean activism, but I realized that it very much like is and can be. And the my goal in terms of storytelling and filmmaking is that I just want to connect to people and to just make them feel seen and not alone. And I really think that we can be successful with that. You know, filmmaking can actually change people's thoughts, perspectives, can even change the world. Um, so I definitely think that art can definitely be activism. Wonderful. And Felicity, would you like to chime in? Yes. Oh my gosh. All the, all the thoughts that everything that everybody is saying, um, it's provoking so many thoughts and feelings. Um, yeah, I, I think that it really, uh, struck me, um, when in terms of representation in particular, when Rebecca and I were casting for our film, we really struggled to find, um, uh, an actor to play the role of auntie. And, um, it just, we kind of both realized, and Rebecca had warned me ahead of time because she had more experience um, casting um, Asian actors, but we kind of both realized, you know, acting was not really much of an option for older Asian, um, <clears throat> older Asian women. And, you know, looking at Cece, who is incredibly talented, and we we're very lucky to have found her. Um, I mean, looking at her background and looking at the few, the very, very, very slim, <laughs> um, uh actors that we were able to audition um you know a lot of these roles that they end up getting and i'm realizing them more and more now after the fact um are you know like nail technician or like you know laundromat owner and stuff like that and it's it's really striking to to kind of to kind of realize you know how far we have come since then but also how far we need to go in order to have a more diverse and interesting um, you know, array of stories for um, Asian Americans and, um, you know, uh, Asian people in general. And um, in addition to that, I would say that something that's really important to me specifically is to show more um, mixed race and mixed culture mm -hmm. um, families and, and people. Um, a little something that was a little bit unplanned, but fortuitous for our film was that we actually do show a biracial couple. Um, Iris's husband is white, um, and it kind of highlights the the sort of tension and also the sort of the the um, not just tension, but also the compromises that are made between the Eastern and Western culture um, in terms of what Iris is going through um yeah but and outside of that i would say too in terms of like storytelling as a form of activism i truly believe that hearing stories and telling stories is the way to get people to change their mind and to think differently mm -hmm. i think that fiction is more powerful and there's been studies about this if you if people read a nonfiction article that's factual it's very easy for them to bring their prejudices to it and be like, you know what, this isn't real. This is from like a from some source that I don't really care about or that I, you know, don't believe or or whatever it is. Um, but if you go into it as a story, they're much more open. They're much more, um, 
you know, able to take it in and think about things differently and um, really start to take on a new viewpoint because, and basically have those barriers taken down in order to basically change their mind. And I think that there's something extremely powerful about that. Um, that's often um, not really valued when you're when you're thinking about, you know, ways in order to to make a difference. Um, but yeah, I, I strongly believe that um, storytelling is a form of activism. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the work that all of you are doing is so important. And I think as Dorothy very pointedly said, it can really change the world. It can really make that kind of difference. So congratulations to all of you for making such a great contribution. Thank you. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, we are, our time is over. We're about a minute over, but I just wanted to thank ever, all, all our panelists, uh, Albert um, Chan and um, Rebecca Chu, Felicity LaHill and Dorothy Zhao. Just thank you so much for um, participating, giving your insights on parenthood and um, revealing the honest truth about it as well and something that we don't typically talk about in, in API um, discussions. So enlightening, opening the door and letting that come out. Really appreciate it. Again, the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival is coming at the end of this month. And uh, please go to svapfilmfest.com and um, check out the films. We have the commitment. We have Sitting the Month. We have Tarot and As Bitter as Sweet. So these are fabulous films you should see. Really appreciate it. And um, again, best wishes. And we look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, our filmmakers. And thank, thank you, you, Isaac, for 